stay tuned to our next segment. Um, quick reminder to check out some of the other streams that we have uh, ongoing on our umbrella platform right now. Right now on our foundations track, we have Cosmos, uh, which is presenting. And then you can also learn all about web hygiene and cleaning up your data and protecting your privacy online in our unlocked track. Uh, so both of those are happening right now. Um, and so now we're going to be transitioning over to um, an exciting guest. We have uh, Brian Brooks, who in March was appointed Chief Operating Officer and First Deputy Comptroller at the U.S. Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. That's quite a long title. Uh, but congratulations on the new role, Brian. Um, and prior to that, you were uh, with Coinbase as the Chief Legal Officer for two years. So thank you so much for joining us. And I see we have Kristen back now. So welcome yep. back, Kristen. Lost you temporarily, but welcome back. Um, yeah, uh, technical difficulties. But um, Brian, uh, can you give us a high level overview of what the OCC does and what your new role is? Well, um, first of all, thanks so much for having me. And uh, and I, I love the fact that even though I'm now in traditional uh, economic areas, I'm still part of the crypto community. So I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, the OCC is the regulator of national banks. And so the way to think about it is we charter and are the primary regulator for almost all of the biggest banks in the United States. And, um, you know, we share bank regulatory responsibility with two other agencies, the Federal Reserve Board and the FDIC. But the OCC's role is a little bit unique um, in that while, while those other agencies have sort of specialized roles, the, the Fed regulates capital and the FDIC regulates resolutions and state banks, the job of the OCC is really kind of to define what a bank is and, and what activities fall within the banking charter. And so you can imagine, given the ambitions of an open financial system, crypto is all about, that there's a big overlap between what, uh, yeah. what we do here and what crypto companies are thinking we will do in the future. Sure, sure. So, so Brian, as we all know, crypto exchanges um, and, and companies in the U.S. are regulated primarily by mo state money transmitter licenses. Um, and this is a different framework from U.S. banks, most of which are regulated which by are regulated federal regulated bank charter. Federal bank um, do you see a future uh, where crypto uh, exchanges could operate under a, an equivalent federal system? Well, um, Aaron, it, it's a great question. And I guess the way I think about it is that um, there are certain reasons why we have a national bank charter that allows a bank to operate in all 50 states without needing to get a bunch of different licenses. It kind of goes back to, you know, uh, the Hamilton era, if you saw the musical, right? The, the, the notion was for the country to grow, <clears throat> we needed to have a strong financial footing. And to be a strong economic country, we have to have the biggest possible market so we can't balkanize our economy state by state. You need a big national platform. There's a historical reason why um, states have certain kinds of licensing authorities and oversight authorities uh, versus the federal government. And crypto is one of those areas where we have to ask ourselves, does it make more sense to think of crypto exchanges and crypto projects as local projects or global projects? If they're global, then the rationale for a single national license uh, starts to make a lot more sense, right? And so one of the questions is over time, <clears throat> how do we conceive of what a crypto really is? Increasingly, I think there's an argument that crypto looks a lot like banking for the 21st century, right? There are stablecoin projects that have a lot of the look and feel of a deposit product. There are um, a number of tokens that look and feel a lot like a payments application. There are a number of things that look like remittance uh, projects and other things, all of which we, we understand historically to be part of the banking system. And so one of my missions at the OCC, which does have a strong innovation office, is to investigate the extent to which over time it makes sense to think of crypto companies like banks and to think about charter types that might be appropriate for crypto companies. Now, that's a, an ambitious objective and would require a big leap of innovation faith. Um, but again, I come back to the idea of things that are inherently borderless, um, like crypto, uh, uh, probably make sense in a license structure that is more broadly applicable than state money transmitter licenses. Brian, is this, now the OCC has been involved in the past with developing a FinTech, FinTech charter, which they haven't yet granted. Is what you're talking about something akin to the FinTech charter or would this be different? Yeah, well, well, that's that's a great insight, Kristen. Um, let, let me just say for your audience that hasn't followed it that the the concept of a fintech charter was based on the idea that traditionally banks did three things, but they don't necessarily have to do all three things to still be a bank, right? So the three things banks historically did was they took deposits, they made loans, and they were involved in payments. 
when the fintech charter was announced a few years ago, the idea was, you know, what if we had a company that made loans but didn't necessarily take deposits? Could that be a bank? And the OCC's answer was, yeah, we think we think a lending company could be a bank even if it doesn't take deposits. Well, if, if you think about a crypto company, a lot of what these tokens are are really payments applications. Uh, you know, they're, they're means of transmitting value on a blockchain from person A to person B to person C without necessarily going through a central intermediary. But there are also other kinds of payments companies that aren't blockchain companies. Think about Stripe and PayPal and, and, and others. And so one of the things I think we have to ask ourselves as an agency is if it makes sense to have a non-depository lending charter, which was the original fintech concept, would it also make sense to have a non-depository payments charter? I don't know the answer to that, but these are questions that we're going to ask. And if the answer were yes, we think that a payments charter is not dissimilar to a fintech charter at some point in the future, then you can well imagine that it wouldn't just be the traditional payments companies like Stripe and PayPal that would want to be part of that environment. There may be crypto companies that would see that as an alternative to a money transmission license and would give them a national platform to do business. So these are all things that we'll explore in our innovation office. And, uh, you know, I think they'll get the attention that they deserve. Sounds like you're asking all the right questions. Uh, Brian, we often hear that crypto companies complain about the difficulty of accessing fiat rails. Um, given that the OCC has, um, you know, such... Uh, jurisdiction over, I think, what, 70% of the banks in the United States. Um, do you have any insight as into why exactly it is so hard for crypto companies to get a bank account? Yeah, it's it's a great question. And uh, obviously, from my time at Coinbase, I saw firsthand how much work you have to do uh, to actually get a banking relationship in the world of crypto. What I would say is, is, is this. I think that there's a little bit of a myth um, and the myth is sometimes believed by crypto companies and sometimes actually believed by banks and bank examiners that crypto is something banks shouldn't touch. And so therefore, if, if the client is a crypto company, then a bank uh, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't want to be in that ecosystem. Truth of the matter is that banks are supposed to provide financial services to all lawful businesses as long as those businesses can comply with basic you know, bank regulatory rules. And usually the things that make this hardest for crypto companies is it's tough to comply with BSA AML uh, or it's tough to have other risk management functions that, uh, that a bank would want to see to make sure that you're not engaged in some kind of uh, you know, money laundering, drug cartel financing, human trafficking or whatever. But as crypto matures, you know, there are increasingly many companies that have perfectly robust risk management systems and do have an ability to comply with those laws. Those kinds of companies shouldn't have trouble finding bank relationships. And again, one of my messages in my new role is going to be to remind um, my colleagues at the OCC that banks not only have the ability, but really have an obligation to serve all lawful business. You know, they shouldn't be discriminating because something's a new technology. As long as the company has KYC and other compliance mechanisms, they should be bankable. And that's going to be a message I'll be promoting a lot. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for your advocacy on that. That's, um, I mean, kind of piggybacking on that, like, how has your worldview just changed in light of spending two years in, in, in working at a, at a crypto unicorn exchange, Coinbase, then now moving into the public sector? I mean, how, how has kind of like your crypto lens, so to speak, like impacted um, you just your, your approach to your role and in government and in perhaps even like this current COVID crisis? I mean, it sounds like you gave a couple examples, good examples there, just that, but maybe from the bigger picture, how is your, how is, how is your crypto experience molding your, uh, your, your, your new approach to, to government? Well, um, in a lot of ways, Aaron. So, so I would remind people who, I mean, I think I know a lot of your viewers, but uh, for those who don't know me, you know, I began a, a fintech journey five or six years ago and uh, was on a couple of fintech boards, was an early investor in a number of fintech companies. And so my, my belief that um, financial services was perhaps not the most fashion forward, you know, not the most innovative segment of the economy was something that I, I came to years and years ago. Um, Crypto has changed my view in a fundamental way, and that is the idea that there are technologies that exist that can decentralize and reduce the single points of failure that our economy is mostly built on. And so, you know, if, if you think back to the lessons of, of the financial crisis, it's that there are a small number of institutions in our society that really are so big and so connected to so many people's lives that, you know, in the words of 2008, they were thought to be too big to fail. And that's 
the natural result um, of a world where you have a small number of institutions who have enormous market power and market share. So if one of them gets in trouble and they were to fail, they would swamp the whole economy. What I learned from my time, um, you know, with uh, with uh, Brian and Emily and others at, on the Coinbase team, is that um, decentralization is the solution, or at least it's a solution to to too big to fail, among other things. Right? When you distribute responsibility for confirming transactions, for transmitting value, doing all these other things across a network of small actors, the network is robust even when a number of small actors go down. Versus in our society, you know, you saw what happened when Fannie Mae failed or when you know, some of the biggest banks failed. Uh, we had a massive crisis that went on for a long time. So, so it's that basic insight that really mattered. And it was also the idea that there's not an either or choice between some of these innovators and the traditional banking system. Look, we need a strong banking system. Uh, for anybody's foreseeable future, the economy revolves around banks. Look, look at the COVID, you, you, since you mentioned COVID. Look at the COVID rescue packages that Congress put together over the last several weeks. The delivery mechanism for almost all of that rescue finance was the banking system because banks are the infrastructure on which the entire economy is built. Everybody's plugged into banking. And so I actually believe that there's a synergy between banks and crypto. I, I think that crypto is going to feed the banking system and will potentially change our view of what the bank charter is about. And I think banks will have to learn from crypto as a way of remaining relevant in the future. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Brian. That's really great insights. And it's, it's really, really exciting to, to, to hear about your new role and, and some of the plans that you have lined up. So best of luck to you in, in your new role. Um, and to our viewers, stay tuned with us here on Capital Controls. We're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll be joined by one of crypto's leading spokesmen on Capitol Hill, Congressman Tom Emmer.